So it is a huge honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, this is the second time I've been to a web science event, and they're always incredibly stimulating, uh, and the ideas are, are amazing. So I feel privileged to be able to speak to you and get uh, such a large swath of the, of the time. Uh, it's also a, a big honor because uh, I'm sure many of you know that today is the 100th birthday of Alan Turing. So uh, we can give a big uh, happy birthday to, to this man. So, you know, I was looking on the web for pictures that would uh, commemorate and also trying to understand, well, you know, we have a pretty creative community, you know, uh, computer science at least, and, you know, Alan Turing touched so many other fields. I wonder what types of things people are doing to commemorate his, uh, his birthday, and I realized that there were lots of different ideas. So uh, PwC apparently had a cybersecurity challenge, with they, which they named the, the Alan Turing Challenge, and of course there are lots of conferences going on, like the uh, cen Centenary Conference, uh, which will be happening at the end of June at the University of Cambridge, the Turing Conference. And, Certainly people have made movies about the guy and you know, you're republishing amazing uh, best-selling books as the uh, centenary edition of the book given that it's his 100th birthday and some people want to label it Alan Turing year and some people aren't quite satisfied with that so they want to label it Alan Turing century. Um, and in addition, uh, you know, ACM got really creative and put his face on a mug. Um, I feel like we should be able to do better than that, right? Um, Google, uh, sorry, there are also uh, t-shirts being made uh, t to commemorate his birthday and uh, there's a, 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 a movement to put him on the 10, note, uh, uh, the 10 pound note in England. Uh, so this is what it would look like if they, if they actually managed to, uh, to make that happen. Google had a doodle today. Uh, which is actually a bit of a, 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 a statistics and cryptographic challenge. And as you figure it out, uh, the puzzle, you light up the, the colors of the Google word uh, on the website. Um, and uh, some people go as far as to say that, you know, if, if Alan Turing would have lived uh, to be 100, he would have probably beaten all of these people to the invention of Google and Facebook and the, the iPhone and Amazon and Twitter. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, we get very creative in our community and, and uh, you know, I would almost say this next one borders on the absurd because I'm not exactly sure what this one is, is meaning, right? I think that's Snow White. I think that's the apple, uh, you know, symbol in her hand, right? So the major lesson to take from all of this is that we're also, we're obviously very creative uh, but, the, but the big lesson to take away from this is that we need to focus. So what I'm going to focus on today is uh, influence in social media networks. Uh, and in fact, um, I'm going to talk about two major things, uh, causal inference and content analysis. Uh, and John actually talked a little bit about this in his talk, that content, and I've seen a lot of really interesting talks here that involve content analysis, the community detection talk that we saw in the last uh, session, for instance, and I do believe that we need to do a lot better at combining structural analysis, network structure, with content analysis that we can learn a lot uh, from that. So this is obviously a big uh, area of interest, influence in social networks. So Mark Zuckerberg was asked at two F8s ago, what do you think is the next big thing? Uh, and he said, well, if I had to put my money on something, it would be social commerce. And this is a UK Wired cover story picture that says commerce gets social. And at the bottom it says how your networks are driving what you buy. And the idea there is that as people like products, share products, et cetera, they send signals to their friends of their preferences. They make their friends aware of different types of products. And there's a very interesting uh, word here, which is the main focus of this sentence, which is driving. And the idea there is that these social signals will influence other people's purchasing habits and thus will affect the structure of the demand curve as a result of these in part automated, in part manual, but digital uh, social signals that could potentially influence other people's behavior. Um, lots of companies are trying to get a handle on this. Obviously, clout is one that's famous. They try to put influence scores uh, on people. Uh, the company at the top there, Social Amp, is a company that I've been involved with, which we just sold to Merkle, which does social commerce solutions for retailers and publishers. 
But it's not just about commerce because obviously digital media and the social signals that we send on digital media also have implications for everything from voter turnout, political mobilization, uh, the Arab Spring. Obviously, Facebook was used to motivate and mobilize and organize people to go out and take real world actions, change their behavior to go protest in the streets. Similar things happened uh, with Occupy Wall Street, and I know that lots of people here have studied the tweet stream of Occupy Wall Street and things like that. These are digital social signals that are potentially influencing the behavior of the people who are receiving them. And I think that there's two major things that we need to understand if we're going to have any real understanding of social influence in digital media networks, but also in general. And the first one is uh, causality, causal inference, and the second one is content, and that's how I'm going to structure the talk today. I'm going to talk first half about causality, second half, maybe the first three-fourths about uh, causality, and the last fourth about, about content. So causality. So, I was trying to think about how I could drive home this notion of influence in social networks, and I thought, who's the, the person that exemplifies this more than anyone? And the person that came to my mind is Ashton Kutcher. As you guys well know, he's very well known on Twitter as A plus K. Lots of people follow him on Twitter. He was so early to this in terms of being an early adopter, he was so motivated to get uh, people to follow him that he actually took out billboards in Los Angeles so that when you were driving down the highway, it said, follow Ashton Kutcher, A plus K, on you know, billboard sized billboards. And so he's really the poster boy for influence in social media networks. And when I looked for this image and I found it, I realized he's actually the poster boy for influence because this is a poster and it has his face on it, and it has the word influence, and it says, behind every great man is something like four million followers, okay? So with a show of hands, let me see everyone who knows who Ashton Kutcher is in this room. That's pretty much everybody. Okay, put your hands down. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, he's a famous movie actor in the United States. Now, everybody put their hands down. That was mostly everybody. Now, raise your hand if you've ever done anything that Ashton Kutcher told you to do. One. OK. So the ratio, the ratio sort of proves the point tongue in cheek, which is that this poster implies that influence is how many followers you have. And certainly, Ashton Kutcher has a big microphone. But nobody is doing anything that Ashton Kutcher is telling them to do, at least in this room. So the question is, is it really influence the number of followers, or is there something more that we should be thinking of when we think about influence in social networks and in social media networks? And I proposed uh, a different definition of social influence, which is how the behaviors of one's peers change the likelihood that or extent to which one engages in a certain behavior. So really what this is about is about behavior change. That doesn't mean that followers aren't important. Maybe if I have some fraction of the people who hear me change their behavior as a result, then the number of people who hear me clearly will matter. But the point is that we've sort of lost sight of what influence is really about, and that is about changing the behavior of the people who are re receiving uh, the message or being aware of the behavior that the influencer is taking on. I have this uh, cartoon on my door in my office, and the reason I have it is because to understand this notion of influence, you have to understand causal inference. So this is two friends talking, and one friend says to the other, I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. And the friend says, it sounds like the class helped, and the guy goes, well, maybe. And the idea there is that certainly, People uh, may be influenced by a class to learn the difference uh, between correlation and causation in a statistics class, but people who select in to the statistics class, who choose to take it, probably have an interest in statistics, and thus probably have a greater prior probability of understanding this difference than the average population. So if you ask people in the class, how many of you know this difference and can you explain it to me, that average is going to be way higher than the population, whether the class is teaching them about the difference or not, because of this selection effect. And people are well aware of this notion of selection bias, and, and you know we're all scientists here, and so we have that uh, notion in the back of our minds, but we've sort of lost sight of this in, uh, in the early work on influence in, in social media networks. That's changing uh, recently, which I'm very, uh, very happy to see. So in network science, this is in part known as the reflection problem. It's a misnomer to think that the reflection problem refers to all of the confounding factors that happen in networks. 
Um, but this has been sort of dubbed the label of, of the problem of correlation and causation in, in social networks. And basically what it means is that human behaviors tend to cluster in network space and in time. But is this because of peer influence or alternative explanations? Okay? And there could be a variety of alternative explanations that would create correlations in behavior over time in a network other than one friend influence the other to adopt the behavior. Right? So there are many estimation challenges in trying to understand influence and separate it from all of these other uh, types of factors. So obviously, if two friends adopt a behavior or a product one right after the, the other, it could be that the first friend is influencing the second friend to adopt that behavior, right? Or it could be, for instance, that people tend to make friends with people who are like themselves, and so people who are friends are more likely to have the same preferences for behaviors, and so will naturally behave in the same ways uh, as each other at approximately the same time, with or without influence being the driving force behind that correlation. Okay? Other examples are confounding factors. Right? So confounding factors are that friends tend to be exposed to the same external stimuli. So if we're friends, we may have, uh, we're maybe more likely to make friends at work, and maybe work will have uh, an incentive uh, for us to go to the gym. Maybe they'll give us a discount to the gym membership, and we'll get a common shock to our likelihood of exercising because we happen to make friends at work. Or maybe we make friends with people who live in our local neighborhoods, and maybe a really good restaurant opens up. So we, again, experience a common shock. And the reason that shock is correlated is because the things that drive us to be friends will make us more likely to be exposed to those external stimuli. And I'm not going to go through this entire list, but there is a, a, a long literature now on the many different problems uh, that come about in trying to estimate causal peer influence and separating it and holding constant some of these other estimation challenges. And there is a literature uh, on uh, causal estimation in networks. So I want uh, to, to spend a minute describing uh, the prior art and, and sort of where we stand today. Uh, so there's peer effects models, which are essentially extended spatial autoregressive models. Um, and these essentially use variation in group size or structure as instrumental variables to try and infer causal parameter estimates between one friend influencing another. And a good paper there that I would recommend to anyone is Jan Bromule uh, and his uh, co-authors et al. 2009 in the Journal of Econometrics. Uh, that's an example of a structural uh, instrumental variable technique. There are actor-oriented models, which, is, uh, which are basically uh, attributable to Tom Snyder's uh, at Oxford. And these models uh, model micro-level decisions that maximize a behavioral utility function and a network utility function simultaneously. And then uh, they apply continuous time uh, Markov models to panel network data, and they estimate this with Markov chain Monte Carlo because, of course, the state space is too big to, to estimate th these things in any uh, short amount of time. They use other simulated method of moments techniques. There's also natural experiments and instrumental variables. So the Sacerdote paper there is the Dartmouth roommate study, right, where people uh, have a, a proclivity to maybe become roommates with their friends. And so if, French, if roommates are assigned randomly, that's a random uh, incentive given to you to be friends with somebody specific. Uh, and that's an exogenous shock to your likelihood of being friends. Uh, another example here is the Catherine Tucker, at, uh, Catherine Tucker solo author paper in 2008 in management science where she used the World Cup as an instrument for whether uh, a friend will influence their friend to adopt a video streaming technology. And the idea behind this was that, well, people in the UK have a greater likelihood of being interested in the World Cup, so they'll have this, during the World Cup, this exogenous shock to their utility from adopting a video uh, a video streaming technology, and the people in the US who are friends with those people in the UK will not be as privy to that shock, and so if they adopt the technology, you can use the exogenous uh, event of the World Cup as an instrumental variable to try and identify uh, peer influence. Now, I'm going to discuss this in a minute, uh, but at the end of, of this long list, there are obvious problems with lots of these techniques. Um, there are also uh, structural models that rely on mathematical identification. Um, 
Jensen and his colleagues uh, at Amherst are doing lots of interesting work on automated discovery of quasi-experimental designs, where they use data mining techniques to try to find natural experiments in data without knowing what those experiments would be ahead of time. And one that we, uh, we helped introduce in 2009 in PNAS is this dynamic match sample estimation, uh, which is basically taking as treatment those people with end friends who have adopted a, a behavior or a product at or before time t, and as the control, those people who are as likely to have end friends as the treated, but who don't have those friends. So in the first stage, you build a predictive model of your likelihood of having a friend who's adopted the product or the behavior, you match people with similar likelihoods, and then you compare the adoption rates of people who have the same likelihoods based on observable characteristics, but one of them has the friend and one of them doesn't. That's the basic approach there. Now, these are all uh, causal inference and observational data methods, but there's a new line of research which I think is incredibly promising, and that is randomized experiments and massive networks, and I'm gonna discuss these uh, in a minute. So, um, there are problems with each of these observational methods. So if you think about the Catherine Tucker paper, it's an incredible paper, one of the, the best of its kind. But there is one fundamental issue with that paper, which is that people who are in the United States, who have friends in the UK, are more likely to want to be interested in the World Cup than the average person in the United States. And that really belies the main problem here which is that edge tells you so much about the preferences of those people, more than you could possibly uh, collect in observable da data about those people, and there's always gonna be that latent amount of homophily that is difficult to control, and Shalizi and Thomas do a very good job in their 2011 paper on, um, on describing this problem of latent homophily. So here's what we did in the Yahoo study. We had a global IM network of 27 million users, detailed demographic and geographic data, comprehensive detailed and precise data on online behaviors and activities, which was 90 billion page views, all the content that they viewed on Yahoo uh, during the six month period. And the day-by-day -day adoption and usage of a mobile service application, Yahoo Go, which was launched in July 2007, that's the adoption curve over time. About half a million people adopted it. And the question we ask in this paper is, can we devise a statistical method to estimate influence and hold constant homophily and confounding factors? And we use this dynamic match sampling technique, which I just described to you briefly. What did we find? If you use... Uh, um, what I'll call a, a naive uh, technique, which is just let's run a model that says how much more likely are you to adopt this behavior if your friends adopt it, and then let's put in control variables for everything that we see, you would get uh, this influence curve. So on the y-axis is how many times more likely are you to adopt the behavior, conditional on having fr a friend or friends that adopted the behavior, and the x-axis is time since product launch. So you see in the first three weeks, you're 16 times more likely to adopt the product if you have a friend or friends who adopted the product. That's a huge number, 16 times more likely. And it also looks like influence decreases over the product's life cycle. If you give this data to a chief marketing officer, they're gonna look at it and they're gonna say, well, I should adopt a peer-to-peer -peer marketing strategy in the early part of the product life cycle and I should adopt a traditional market segmentation strategy in the later part of the product life cycle. And if you supported that in, in your, uh, in your you know, uh, strategic advice to them with this data set, you'd be wrong. Because if you control for homophily and confounding factors, the influence curve actually looks like this. Which means, yes, there is influence, about three or four times more likely in the first uh, three weeks of the product launch, but it's much less than we originally thought. Oh, and it's constant over time. And the question is, well, why is it that this happens, this big gap at the beginning but not at the end? And I call that basically the iPad effect. Okay? And the reason why I call it the iPad effect is that, oops, is that there's exaggerated homophily amongst early adopters. Homophily is a bigger problem amongst early adopters than it is late adopters. So what this shows is the cosine similarity of all of those vector of attributes that we had, demographics, page views, et cetera, for adopters to their uh, adopter friends in hollow circles, their non-adopter friends in these squares, and to a random user in these diamonds. And so you see at the beginning of the product life cycle, adopters are much more similar to their other adopter friends, not as similar to their non-adopter friends, even though they are friends with them. And six months later, people who adopt here are just as, as similar to their adopter friends as their non-adopter friends. 
What does that mean in English? It means that people who are waiting in line to buy the iPad are more like people who are, who are their friends waiting in line with them to adopt the iPad than people who buy the iPad six months out. They're more like you and me, normal people, okay? unless, unless there are people here who waited uh, in line to adopt the iPad, in which case we're the weird people. Um, so that, that's basically uh, uh, an example of this match sample technique. Now, I described a weakness of, of potential weakness of the instrumental variables technique with, with the World Cup. The potential weakness here is that you have to have a lot of good data about the people so that in your first stage, your matching stage is good, right? If you don't have a lot of good data, if you just have age and gender, this isn't going to work very well for you. But if you have a lot of data on what they do and what types of uh, page views they have, this is going to work extremely well for you. And let me sort of prove that to you. Um, Eitan Bakshi did a, a, and colleagues, Lada I think was on this paper, and Cameron Marlowe, and I think Itamar Rosen, uh, in 2011, and they did an experiment on uh, sharing uh, on Facebook in the news feed where they did a randomization, and they estimated some parameters around sharing. Um, and what Dean Eccles did in one of the chapters of his dissertation, uh, Dean is now going to be at Facebook, he's been at, at, at Stanford, he's finishing his PhD there, is he did what's called a uh, constructed observational study. So he said, oh, we have an experiment here. What would my estimates have been like if I applied an observational technique? Now that I've got the experiment, I've got the actual estimates under randomization, how close can we come? And what this shows you is the risk difference and the risk ratio for different estimation techniques and the experiment here, okay? This is naive estimation. Uh, this is using just demographic variables in the matching. This is using just how much you share and in what ways you share in the matching. This is uh, an expert-driven model where domain expertise was used to pick which variables are used in the model. This is sharing, but little s means same domain sharing, okay? And this is B with a little s, which means, again, we use same domain sharing. Not just broadly your patterns of sharing, but sharing the same content type, okay? Uh, and this is all of the variables. And what you see here is that the naive method and these smaller uh, vectors of, of attribute methods don't achieve, uh, don't perform very well with regard to trying to get to this uh, experimental estimate. Uh, but these other methods, uh, when you use same domain sharing uh, and, and the, all the variables together, can get pretty close to the experimental estimate, okay? And in fact, what this shows you is the relative risk ratio, and again, you see that there's really no statistically significant difference between the experimental method and these observational causal inference methods. But if you use the wrong variables, you are way off, way, way off, okay? Here's the percent error reduction for the risk difference. This, is, this blue line is the experimental method. These are uh, the methods that I already described to you. So high dimensional propensity score matching, which is what we did in the PNAS paper, can achieve an 80% error reduction. Okay? But context relevant variables are critical, which is why our page view variables were so important in that study, as opposed to just the demographic and geographic variables. And the more variables, you might be wondering, why does A not perform the best? And the answer is because uh, when you use all the variables, you simultaneously increase uh, sampling variance. Okay? Now, what this relates to is something that John said yesterday when he looked at Wikipedia and he looked at same domain experts versus different domain experts. And he showed that when you break it down, when you stratify the sample across high and low status within domain, you get more sensical results in terms of status and you, you sort of lose that bump in the second bit. This is, again, in a completely different context showing the value of context relevant variables to making sense of the data that we're uh, interested in. Um, and that, keep that in mind when I talk about content, because that is an example of highly context relevant uh, data that can be used to make better inference. So there's also been a big move recently, and you see it's very recent, I mean really 2010 and beyond, uh, to do r massive experiments in networks like Facebook and other networks, and there are several types of, of, of experiments. 
So network structure randomization is trying to understand how the structure affects the spread of a, of a behavior. And Damon Sol Santola has been doing some amazing work uh, on this. He published two papers there uh, in Science uh, on a Health Buddies website that he controlled. Um, treatment randomization, uh, where you essentially give people a product or a behavior and you see how it affects their friends. So Ahmed and Ravi Bapna uh, uh, have this working paper where they gift people Last.fm subscriptions and then they see how that affects the subscription rate of their friends and they gift randomly. There's channel randomization, which we use in our management science paper in 2011, where we turn on and off different channels, and we see how that affects the propagation of the product in the network. And there are these message randomization uh, techniques that uh, Eitan, Lada, uh, Cameron, and Itamar used, and that um, there's a working paper uh, by James Fowler on political mobilization using this. And our recent science paper, which came out on Thursday, uses this as well, where you randomize or randomly block some messages to try and estimate uh, influence. So let me describe the management science paper to you. Um, so what this paper does is it asks a more sophisticated question than the PNAS paper, right? It says, the PNAS paper was take a product that you already have and tell me whether there's peer influence going on. This paper says, can we design the product to go viral from the beginning? In the product design phase, can we add features to the product that are, that are likely to make it go viral? And so what we studied was, well, we had this whole theoretical framework of personalization and activity, and we studied two features. The first feature was personalized referrals, invitation privileges, the ability to invite your friend digitally to join you on the product. And the second one was automated broadcast notifications. Every time you took uh, an action on the digital application that we used, it sent a message to your friends that said, hey, you know, Sinon did this on the application today. You might be interested in this application. Here's a link to, to adopt the product. Okay? And this is nothing new. If you think back to Hotmail, every time you send an email with Hotmail at the bottom, it said, get your free Hotmail at www.hotmail.com, which meant that every email was an advertisement for a product for the product, and it had a path to product adoption because the link was right there and you could go download Hotmail. And if you remember, Hotmail was, one of, was a hugely viral product success in, in the mid-1990s. So what we theorized in this paper is that, yes, there should be greater marginal influence going up this gradient because these are uh, targeted to specific individuals, they're more personalized, et cetera, so they should be more effective per message, but you should get more messages going in the opposite direction because it takes effort and time for you to invite people, right? And if it's an automated uh, thing, then uh, potentially you're going to get more messages. So which one of these is more effective at spreading the product is an empirical question. So we had this application, we divided people into control and experimental uh, groups, and we randomly enabled these features for people uh, and disabled them for other people. And then we observed the adoption and use of the application by friends of the control and experimental group. So this is different than a traditional randomized study, right? Because typically you give somebody a placebo, you give the other person the drug, and you look at what happens to them. Here, we treat this person over here, and then we look over here at what their friends are doing as a result of the treatment to them, okay? And that's basically what this type of randomization tries to get at. We had data on 10,000 experimental users. They had about 1.4 million uh, friends, which were the response users that we were looking at. And we observed you know, their profile data, but also adoption and use of the application. Not just whether they adopted, but how intensely they used it. So we had this baseline group, this passive broadcast group, and this invitation group. Uh, and a note about these types of randomized experiments you have to be worried about leakage and contamination because this is a network and people are talking to one another. So leakage could, could occur if they're connected through indirect pathways, if they're connected to multiple treated peers in different treatment groups or in the same treatment group. So for example, here you have somebody who is one of your, the response users that you want to observe, but they're connected to someone in the treatment group. They're also connected to someone in the control group, right? Or here, this guy is connected to many people in the treatment group, so maybe there's going to be a disproportionate amount of influence on them, right? So these scenarios were relatively rare in our data, but anyone that tries to do this in the network setting has to be aware of this, has to put in their appendix exactly what they did and how they got around it. So the way that we controlled for leakage and peers of multiple treated users, uh, we only evaluated recruited users and right-censored contaminated peers. 
And what is a contaminated peer? Well, we define that as any peer with multiple treated peers after the time at which they had multiple treated peers. So they were all good until they had somebody, uh, they had more than one treated peer. Okay? And then they were contaminated. What does that mean? Well, this is a, an originally recruited user, and they have two friends. This person adopts at time one, this person adopts at time two, and they have a connection. So at this point, when just this person is the adopter, these people are still legitimate parts of our study. As soon as this person adopts, then now this person has two uh, multiple treated peers. This person gets censored at T1 and beyond. Okay? Here you have the same scenario, but these people are not connected, so everyone remains legitimate through T0, T1, and T2. Okay? So this may make our results slightly more conservative, but it also makes sure that there are no confounding from leakage and contamination. Okay? Another issue about estimation in this context with randomized experiments. So the conventional approach to estimating social contagions and social epidemics is that you estimate the likelihood or the, or the rate at which people adopt a behavior conditional on not having adopted it bef before as a function of two basic types of things, their characteristics and some adjacency matrix and the characteristics or behaviors of their friends. Okay? Now, Typically, the way that's done is through this, uh, this conventional type of approach where you take all of the behaviors of people's friends and you estimate the likelihood of this person adopting as a function of their friend's behavior. But if you're trying to do a randomized experiment, I'm sure looking at this picture, you can already see the problem. In order to eke out one observation of my experiment, I have to control the entire social environment of that person experimentally, which is impossible, especially on Facebook. It doesn't make sense to do it that way. So what we talked about in our paper and what we describe in also the IEEE paper that you mentioned is this inside-out approach where we treat the person in the middle and then we estimate the behaviors of the people on the outside, this inside-out approach. But the problem is that this also creates its own estimation challenges. Okay? The first one is that, um, you know, this is a network, so these are not independent observations. The second one is that this is probably not a linear process, that the rate at which the first person adopts is probably not the same as the second person, the third person, the fourth person, right, for a variety of reasons of sort of echo chamber, of also more likely uh, of being similar, et cetera, right? So what we did was we uh, specified this variance corrected stratified duration model, which is just a long-winded way of saying we did two things. We indexed the baseline hazard rate of each of these potential adopters by whether they were the first, second, third, fourth adopter. Right? So we gave a different uh, baseline to each stage of the diffusion process in a local network. And then we corrected the variance for the connections between individuals to solve the IID problem. Okay? What did we find? Well, uh, we found that as we predicted, personal invitations were more effective per message, about three times more effective per message. Right? Um, and they nearly doubled the global diffusion in the population, but it was the broadcast messages which had the biggest effect on the diffusion of the product. Why? Even though they were less effective per message, there were many more messages that were being sent, so they created much more adoption. And if you're looking at this result, you think to yourself, yeah, okay, it looks first like personal invitations are the way to go, then it looks like you know, the notifications are the way to go, but we also found this really interesting result that which feature you used affected the likelihood that the original adopter would churn, would stop using the product. So personal invitations generated a 17% increase in stickiness, the likelihood to stick with the behavior. Notifications did not. Why? Well, our first thought was network externalities, right? If my friends join me on the product, I'm more likely to stick with the product because the value to me of this movie sharing application that we studied is more interesting if my friends are also using it. It's a social value to me to see their movie recommendations, not just the average person's movie recommendations. Now, you might ask, well, why isn't that happening over here? And the answer is because these are the people who invited the specific people they wanted to use the app with to join them. Those people have this network externality on them, but 
the randomly chosen people from their network, these aren't randomly chosen from the population of people in general, they're from their Facebook network, but they're not selected by the original user, didn't have this same effect. Which means that there are local network externalities which are, depend on content specific interests between people. Okay? This also implies that there's a virtuous cycle between peer adoption and engagement. As I invite my friends to adopt, I'm more engaged with the product as they adopt. As I'm more engaged with the product, I send more messages. More of my friends adopt, I'm more engaged, etc. And when I you know, give this uh, result in audiences like this, I can immediately pick out who the marketing professionals are because they sort of lean forward in their seats like this, because this looks very much like a free lunch, like a, like a, a multiplier effect. And I'm sure there are diminishing returns to this, right? That as you get, go down your list of best friends, that the 10th friend doesn't have it nearly the same effect on engagement as the first or second friend that are more important to you. But there's still this virtuous cycle. Doesn't just apply to commerce, we're applying the same scientific principles of influence and networks to spread HIV testing in South Africa. We have a major pilot program there where we're trying to give people incentives to do HIV testing and additional incentives to convince their friends to uh, take an HIV test as well. They're actually making a movie about this. It's called The Social Cure. It's a documentary film and you can follow it at The Social Cure in the interest of social media influence. So in a second study that we did with this same movie application, um, which was published in Science on Thursday, we took the notifications and we randomized the receipt of the notifications inside the local network. So only a randomly selected subset of neighbors received the passive viral messages. This enabled us to test randomized trials of influence and susceptibility to influence uh, in this way. So what happens is the user, when they take an action on the movie application, like they rate a, uh, a movie, it creates a notification packet like this one, four notifications, and then it randomly disperses them across their Facebook friends. They take another action, they rate another movie, and it randomly disperses those notifications across their friends. So the key to this method is that the messaging is randomized. Right? Each person in your local uh, Facebook network has an equal likelihood of receiving a message from you. Uh, and two people, one that receives a message and one that doesn't, are identical in expectation. That's what randomization buys you. They're identical in terms of their homophily to you. They're identical in terms of their likelihood to have been exposed to advertising. They're identical in terms of their prior likelihood to be interested in movies, etc. In expectation, they're identical. That's what randomization is all about. So what do we do? We estimate this model, which is again one of these duration models. And the reason we use duration is because we have these great timestamps on behavior in digital data when we know second by second when people do things. And this is important because how quickly someone responds might be an indication of influence. So to throw all that away and just say let's estimate a logit model and the probability of adoption, you know, we have way more information there to work with. So what we estimate is this model. The first term there is the notification parameter. That's just like, what is the effect of having a getting a notification on your likelihood of adopting? And having this in the model holds constant the awareness effect of just receiving notifications in general, on average. The second parameter is a spontaneous adoption parameter. You see there that that's just the characteristics of the person uh, adopting, the sender. Uh, and what does that do to their likelihood of adopting? the rate of adopting. This is the spontaneous adoption parameter of J, right? This I is the sender, J is the receiver. This is the influence parameter. What this is is just the interaction between one of your characteristics and the notification on your likelihood of achieving adopters in your local network. So that would be men crossed with notification. What's the parameter on that? What is the differential impact of being a man on gaining adopters in your network upon sending messages to them. What is the influence of an influence mediating message on your likelihood of changing the behavior of people in your local network? And this parameter is the susceptibility parameter because it crosses notifications with the receiver's characteristics. How much more likely am I to respond positively to this influence mediating message if I'm a man or a woman? Okay. We also do dyadic models because we want to know, do men influence women or do women influence men? 
Do the young influence the old, or do the old influence the young, et cetera? So that's a dyadic characteristic. It's the same uh, idea. Here's the notification parameter. Here's the homophilus induction parameter, which means what is the uh, impact of a specific characteristic, sharing a characteristic, on your likelihood to spontaneously adopt the product? How much does homophily, your correlation and preferences, explain your, the recipient's likelihood of adopting? And this one is the influence induction parameter. You know, uh, what is that crossed with the notification? So how much more likely are you to influence someone, if you're a man and they're a woman, given that you send a, a message to them? Okay? So what do we find with this type of analysis? Well, here you see the hazard ratio increasing, decreasing. This is age gender, and relationship status. So we find, for instance, that influence increases with age. Influence is in these dark gray bars, and susceptibility to influence is in these light gray bars. Influence increases with age. Susceptibility decreases with age. Women are less susceptible to influence than men. Single and married individuals are more influential than those people who are in a relationship, engaged, or label themselves as it's complicated. Married individuals are the least susceptible to influence, while engaged individuals are the most susceptible to influence. And we can look at dyadic results. So influence transmits more over relationship pairs of the same age. Okay? So there's suggestive evidence that older people influence younger people more than younger people influence older people. Women are less susceptible to influence than men, again, and influence transmits more over relationship pairs where the sender is of the same or greater level of relationship commitment to the recipient. And this holds constant age and all that, that other stuff. This is the, the, the um, holding constant, all of those other parameters. So to put this very clearly to you, this is susceptibility to influence as a function of your relationship status. If you're single, you're more susceptible to influence than people who don't report their relationship status on Facebook. That's the baseline. If you're in a relationship, you're even more susceptible to influence. If you're engaged, you're even more susceptible to peer influence than if you're in a relationship. And if you're married, you're not susceptible to peer influence at all, apparently. And if you label yourself as it's complicated, you're the most susceptible to peer influence. Okay? So, the next thing that we can do with these results is we can examine the joint distribution of influence and susceptibility in the network. How does this stuff cluster? Do influentials tend to be connected to other influentials? Do susceptibles cluster together, et cetera? And what does that mean for the propagation of a behavior in the network? The first thing that we can, and what's the time, by the way? OK, all right, let me speed up a little bit. Let me just point out two important things from this, and you can read the paper to see some of the other things that we can glean from this. The major thing to take away from this is that, you know, there was Katz and Lazarsfeld who said, you know, the influential hypothesis, influential in individuals, you know, spread behaviors in society. Malcolm Gladwell picked up on this, and then people like Duncan Watts said, hey, no, it's probably more likely that the prevalence of susceptible individuals is driving that this behavior, behavior spread in, in networks and in populations. It actually turns out that it's the joint distribution of the two which determines how a behavior will spread in the network. The first graph here is your own influence plotted against your own susceptibility. And what you notice is that people who tend to be influential tend not to be susceptible. People who tend to be susceptible tend not to be influential. There's almost no one who's both highly influential and highly susceptible in the network. There's also, if you plot your own influence and your peers' influence, there's this cluster of individuals who are of above average influence and who their friends are above average influence as well. And that cluster could potentially be super spreader uh, type people. However, you have to be aware that those people are less susceptible to influence as per panel one. So a sophisticated simulation model could take these parameter estimates and tell us which one of these things is going to win out. So Another thing that we're very interested in is, for instance, is there social bias or social influence bias in ratings? And John talked about ratings or stars uh, yesterday in his talk. So take a, a website like Reddit. They have these comments where you can comment on any article, right? <clears throat> this one has 165 comments, 227 comments. And if you go to one of those comments, it looks something like this. 
And if you look at a bunch of these comments, you see that each one of them has these points, 37 points, 10 points. And what you can do is you can vote up these comments. Well, this one is pretty good, and this one is not so good. Like this one has detailed emphasis, has a link to a map, has statistics, and you might want to vote that one up, and its, its score might go up. And our question is, what happens to your perception of the quality of the comment if, the score, if there's already a prior vote on it? In other words, you have all of these rating systems around the web, not only on Wikipedia like John talked about, but on Reddit, you have ratings on products, et cetera, et cetera. What does that do to our perception of the product and does it introduce any social influence bias into our own evaluation of the quality of the product? So we did an experiment where we uh, used a website like Reddit and we randomly manipulated just the first vote on a comment. Give some of them up one, some of them down one and a control group where we did nothing. And here's what we found. We found that there was a 25% increase in the mean rating of the, people that we, of the comments that we treated with an up vote and no change in the mean rating of the comments that we treated with a down vote. 25% increase in the average rating. That means that there is positive hurting due to social influence bias, but no negative hurting due to social influence bias. Why does that happen? So here you see it. This is the final score distribution of the positively treated, the negatively treated, and the control group. Uh, and this is your mean score of the positively treated, the negatively treated, and the control group. Okay? Why does that happen? There's a correction effect. People, if they see a positive vote, they're likely to go along with it and say, oh yeah, that's probably a good comment. But if they see a negative vote that seems out of place, they're like, oh, that's not right. I'm going to give that a positive vote, even more than the ones that we treated positively. So they correct, they don't correct, they go along with the positive manipulation, and they correct the negative manipulation, which means that there's no negative hurting, but positive hurting. And this has lots of implications for things like bubbles, right? Because there's a directionality to this influence bias. It also has implications for elections. Do polls predict or create outcomes in elections? So we notice that this varies by topic, right? So there's lots of social influence bias in business, culture, and society, and politics, not much in general news, economics, IT, okay? And friends and enemies uh, behave differently. I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. Let me talk for about five minutes on content, okay? Everybody knows the strength of weak ties argument, seminal work, Ron uh, Burt and Mark Granovetter, and others, many, many others. That first paper has about 17,000 citations. Basically, what this argument says is that these weak ties are likely to deliver novel information. So in a network like this, value comes from the uneven distribution of information across network neighborhoods. Your connection to diverse groups gives you access to this novel information, and that novel information can help you innovate, can help you broker opportunities, and can bring benefits to you. So here's a broker in the middle connected to four uh, diverse cliques, and they're more likely to get novel information. But this is a 40-year-old assumption. There's lots of papers showing that in many different contexts, diverse networks are associated with innovation and performance. And the assumption is that, and the key theoretical me mechanism is that, diverse networks give you diverse novel information, which leads to productivity, performance, innovation. But that middle part had never really been tested before. Do people actually get novel information? So we looked at this in an executive recruiting firm. Here's the network of that firm. And we measured information diversity and novelty using information theoretic measures and vector space models. We essentially represented emails as uh, term vectors, and then we represented inboxes and outboxes as collections of these email vectors, and we measured the variance of these uh, inboxes and outboxes, and we measured how much novel information was coming to the broker as a function of their network structure. And what we found was that there was a diversity bandwidth trade-off. And we published this in the American Journal of Sociology in 2011, that as the network became more diverse, the bandwidth of the communication channels contracted, which created countervailing effects on access to novel information. On one hand, the person who you were connected to who was diverse, the weak tie, was more likely to give you different information, but at a much slower rate, because you talk to them less often, and you engage with them on unidimensional topics instead of talking about lots of things with them. 
And we verified this in data. And we found that there were three factors that basically moderated whether bandwidth or diversity was more important to receiving novel information. In a recent working paper, we validated these results in a completely different context and setting. This is constraint and access to non-redundant information in our AJS paper. This is in a completely different firm uh, replicating the result in the 2012 uh, working paper. This is network size and constraint in the original executive recruiting firm. This is network size and constraint uh, in, in our recent study in a completely different firm. This is network size and the diversity of the information you receive. This is network size and the diversity of information you receive in, again, a completely different setting. We feel like this theory is uh, replicable and generalizable across organizations. We also uncovered the mechanisms that were driving this diversity bandwidth trade-off. Strong cohesive ties deliver more diversity and more to total novelty because of the bandwidth effect. But the weak ties deliver unique information, that which is the most different than what the other ties deliver. And separating out these different types of novelty, diversity, total amount of non-redundant bits, and uniqueness is important to understand how this theory should move forward. And we also found that the main reason for this is that the original theory neglects within channel variants, only looks across channel. Bert and Granovetter say, if these two people are unconnected, A is likely to give you information that's different than what B is likely to give you. But they neglect to think about whether A and B, if they're connected or not connected, will give you more or less information over that channel over time, within information diversity and across channel information diversity. What we find in the second paper, and I'll stop with this result, is that in a cohesive network of strong ties, Across channel diversity is low, but within channel diversity is very high. The diversity of information across this channel is high. High uh, diversity, high total novelty, okay? But it's not much different than this channel. But over here, this channel's information is much different than this channel, but within each of these channels over time, diversity is low, total non-redundant information is low. So there's this trade-off between within and across channel diversity that drives this diversity bandwidth trade-off argument. Okay? Um, we also examine dynamics, but I'm going to stop there in the interest of time uh, and say thank you very much and take, take some questions. <laughs>